The other area I want to talk about in terms of leadership is, of course, youth. I'm not young anymore, so I can't um, speak on your behalf, and there are many of you, so I'm going to give you a chance to say your piece later. But I just want to say um, that youth engagement, that's, it's really sad, right, when you go, I mean, I remember going to, my first trip to Africa, actually, um, as an adult, was in the mid-80s. And when I went to Tanzania, I went to Tanzania, and when I went to Tanzania, kids were in school. They were all in school. It was hardly, it was very rare to find a child on the street during the daytime. They were in school. Not that the schools were well resourced or anything like that, but they were in school. Right? Went back a few years later, say three years later, after structural adjustment was introduced, kids were on the street. The number, and I, I saw the same in Zimbabwe and other countries, how the number of streets children started to increase and increase because parents could no longer pay the fees. They could no longer look after them. Right? And so um, what we had, I would say, was a lost generation. Where, and there must be a cohort of Africans who are, told, who are illiterate as a result of that shift with, with, with respect to structural adjustments. Um, and now, of course, we know people can't, you know, it really depends on who can pay. Um, some countries have shifted because of the pressures, like Kenya, have now, I think, you have free primary and secondary school education. But again, because of the democratic struggles of the people for that. Right? But up until then, it was, you know, there, you could say the international community, the World Bank, the IMF, just didn't care about the education of Africans. Right? Um, and you here should know how important education is, because you're, you know, you're young scholars and academics. So the, the notion of youth, you know, um, is the, the problems that the youth are facing is incredible because they'll never be able to realize some of their dreams. Um, the issue of, um, I, during the Egyptian uh, uh, whatever, up, uprising and revolution, I um, was looking at, the, I started to do some reading around Egypt and I was, I think, read, I think it was the, one of the UNDP reports for Egypt. And it said there were some 30 million youth who were unemployed in Egypt. And not only that, it said they existed in a state called Waitu. Right. Right. So there's this new term. In fact, in my discipline, geography, a lot of young people, my you know, students in the department, are interested in the concept of waiting. Right. You're waiting. People are waiting in this limbo state. They're waiting to start their lives. They're waiting. You know, they have no jobs. They have no prospects of, get, of getting married. They have no prospect of settling down. So they're in this country, you know, there's 30 million youth in Egypt awaiting to start their lives. And think about that in other parts of Africa. Right? Think about those youth who risk their lives to cross the Mediterranean, to get into Europe, right? to avoid the trap of waiting. Um, so the issue of youth, I think, youth engagement is really important. How do we mobilize our youth? How do we get them to demand action on the ground? And there is now a real disconnect between the elite and the youth. Right? I mean, and the elite and the rest of the population, the masses, the rest of the population. Because the elite have virtually abandoned the masses. You know, structure just, you know, help them. <laughs> because they, you know, they need to worry about them. They'll look after themselves. You know, everybody, we're all individuals now. Right? So the elite will look after their own children, send them off to school in Europe or wherever, make sure they get the best education. But the rest, the masses, are irrelevant. And we have to campaign. You who have had the opportunity of good education, but some of the, the best education, have to campaign that those young people right, are not left behind. Because they are the ones, in fact, you won't be able to go back and settle in your comfortable middle class homes unless you help those young people. <laughs> so you, you're, you're in it with them together. So you have to start thinking about how you can reach out to, to young people. And I think that's, that the leadership is going to come from there. And it might be, I'm not proposing violence, but it might be violent. Because if they can, if, how long can these different cohorts of young people go through without education, inadequately educated? Some will have start and stop, start and stop. And can you imagine the aspirations that they have, that you have? Imagine, you know, someone who as aspiring, he says, oh God, I'd like to be a doctor. And probably brilliant. Yeah. When the president of ECOWAS came here um, last November to speak, I said to him, he was, you know, I think there was a question. I, I asked him a question in private, actually. I said, you know, would, 
he was talking about opportunities in Africa. He said, would somebody from the village, I think he came from a poor, poor family, I said, would somebody from a village now be able to go to university and become head of ECOWAS? A poor you know, kid with bare feet from the village. I don't think it's possible now. Because how, who's going to provide for their education? Who's going to get them through? For poor kid, peasant household, it's not possible. But during, you know, in the 60s, Nkrumah, Nyeri, and others invested in education. So those barefoot boys and girls could actually you know, get an education and move up. And I, I'd say the same thing for Britain. Uh, if it wasn't for government scholarships, you know, from you know, right the way through, I would not you know, have, have even got a PhD over here. Right? And they were free. Right? So the issue of education is really important, and that's the basis on which I think one of the things you guys should be campaigning for. And um, so those are the two things. I think leadership, women, definitely. I'm not, I don't want to abandon African men. I have to say something here. Right? So I have to say something about the men, right? But especially those who are not you. <laughs> you have people who deal with themselves. Um, because, I, you know, despite my campaigning for women, I don't think, uh, and I realize that men are going to feel threatened. And, they're, and they're, you know, some people talk about the crisis of masculinity in Africa. With, they argue that with modernization, African men don't know, know what their role is now, and that's why they're hitting their women and all this, and so on. Right? Um, and there might be. I think, you know, I, I went to Kenya last time, and I talked to a lot of African men. And, the, you know, there is, an, there is a problem. But, is it the, but I think, you know, Understanding the nature of the problem, the root of the problem is, not, is important. It's not that these men want to beat their wives or whatever. But sometimes the stresses within those societies force people. In fact, there was research done um, by, I think, in the UK and probably North America to show that um, the men, men tend to commit violent acts against uh, women. If the most likely state a man could be for him to commit a violent act against a woman is if he's unemployed. Um, and uh, not, <laughs> but uh, and that's and you can t you can tell in a crisis situation in many and uh, often also if he's unemployed and his wife is working, as even more he sees that as even more threatening. Uh, so the crisis situation in Africa. Uh, the collapse of um, livelihoods, whether it's rural or urban, you know, um, will have an implications on how people behave. And, it's, uh, and for women and men, they've got to start negotiating together. But men cannot expect, they're not going to get any real changes, actually, unless they align with women and they um, participate with the empowerment of women. <coughs> so you have to start negotiating within the domestic sphere. Right? Uh, who, who does what? Who does the washing? Who looks after the children? And things have changed. You know, one of my interviews in Kenya said, ah, my father, he could just get up and go. You know, if he wanted to travel across the country, he'd just say, I'm going. Uh, now, if I was to do that, I have to negotiate for several days with my wife. We have to make arrangements and so on. And that's the reality. Things have changed. Not only, it's not just the fact that he has become, it's not that he has become disempowered. But the whole nuclear family structure, the whole family, extended family structures, uh, you know, around him as well, or around the family, has disappeared. They're, they're more isolated in the urban communities for a variety of reasons, and they're reliant on each other in ways that they weren't reliant to before. So we have to start looking more, at understanding gender relations, understanding the way men and women interact, and how that is changing. Masculinity and femininity, when they're, you know, has, has always been dynamic. And we've always had to adapt. So this notion of, you I'm a traditional African man or I'm a traditional African woman is nonsense, right? They've always been changing. And it's, in order, we have to live together, you know? And uh, we have to learn to love each other. Emotion, emotion, affect is a very important part of being human. So if we're going to be, you know, if we're going to live together, <laughs> you know, it's, it's essential that we um, talk together and, and talk about these things in the open. Right, I think I'll stop there. And... Um, I, I, yeah, I didn't have anything to say, actually. <laughs> <laughs>